Hello, you're watching The Big Interview with me, Smriti Vidyarthi. Joining me now is Speaker of the National Assembly, Justin Muturi. You served as a member of the Parliamentary Select Committee on Constitutional Review from 1999 all the way through to 2004. What are some of your recollections regarding the fight for new reforms and a new constitution? You know, I'm, I, I recall the very, very tumultuous times uh, of uh, that period, 1999 uh, through 2000 because uh, the motion to set up a parliamentary select committee on the constitution, on the review of the constitution, was moved by the Honorable Raila Molondinga. Uh, those days, the practice was you would suggest names of people to sit in the committee. Uh, his party then was in cooperation with uh, the ruling party, Kanu. So he was with us, and uh, I was in Kanu myself. We set up the committee, but the uh, majority of the members from the then opposition, uh, namely the Democratic Party, led by Mwai Kibaki, and Fond Kenya, led by the late Wamal Wakijana, all of them refused to join. They opted to remain with, in sympathy with the Ufungamano Initiative, which was basically the religious community and civil society, most of the civil society groups. Yash Pao Guy, to his credit, and of course uh, not to the surprise of many of us, was able to breach the define that was always there because the, the suspicion was that this Raira-led group and Raira's party was in cooperation with Kanu. There was, there was always some suspicion that uh, they, they are not up to go any good. But much to his credit, Yash Paul Guy was able to reach out. Well, 10 years later, what are your feelings about the implementation and the performance of the constitution? Do we still have something to celebrate? Um, I think one of the greatest achievements about this constitution is uh, devolution. Uh, in as much as you know, of course, there's, there's always been suspicion who supports the devolution, who doesn't support devolution. But I think it will be it will be wishful thinking to talk about uh, anybody not supporting uh, devolution, which is one of the hallmarks of work, this constitution. Um, of course, there have been those uh, moments, as you I'm sure you may be very well aware, when we have had difficulties in uh, arriving at certain decisions. Uh, particularly when it came to division of revenue. Uh, of course, and you know division of revenue is one that defines revenue vertically between the two levels of government. So, of course, there's a role to be played by the National Assembly and the role to be played by the Senate. At that time, usually, there's really no, not much role to be played by the counties. But uh, an opposition that that has happened largely I would say, with the tremendous success, is uh, an accolade that will be given to the institutional parliament and I think also to the entire state machinery. As the Speaker of the National Assembly, where uh, much of the laws to conform to the new constitution and the implementation of it took place, what was that like for you being the Speaker? The successor parliament, which was a grand coalition parliament, and this work cut out after the promulgation. There were very many things which needed to be done. And I must congratulate uh, my predecessor because he was able to see through many of those. <clears throat> but unfortunately, what remained to be, to be passed was much, much more. 
it fell on uh, my successor parliament, the 11th parliament. Uh, and I could say, without any fear of contradiction, that we have largely 99.9% .9 fulfilled our mandate. But the two-thirds gender rule, which is a key section, is yet to be enacted. What do you make of the constant failures to pass this law? I also want to actually disabuse every Kenyan's mind. You can look at the, the fifth schedule to the Constitution. Any reference to two-thirds in the Constitution is in Article 27, clauses 6 and 8. And it says, the state shall ensure that the principle of not more than two thirds of either gender is implemented in all elective bodies, including Football Association of Kenya. Yeah? Yeah? The state, not parliament. The closest that anybody can talk about is Article, after that, uh, Article 27 is in the Bill of Rights. It's an obligation given to the state. The judiciary is part of the state. The executive is part of the state. That's why the president is a state officer. The chief justice is a state officer. The attorney general is a state officer, as much as I am a state officer. So I would want to know, I would want to see anybody, any Kenyan lawyer, telling me where it is an obligation was placed on Parliament to enact any law that provides for the two-thirds gender rule. The obligation is on the state. The next reference is in Article 81B, which talks about the electoral system. It says the electoral system shall ensure that no more than two-thirds of either gender are represented. So therefore, but are Article you saying... 100, Article 100 provides that Parliament shall enact legislation to provide for the representation in Parliament of A, women, B, youth, C, persons living with disabilities, D, marginalized uh, groups, and D, minorities. That is the law I have struggled over the last seven years to persuade, particularly Kewopa, Kenya Women Parliamentary Association, that this is a law we are supposed to enact. There is no requirement anywhere. Go to the fifth schedule, go to the entire constitution that says Parliament shall enact a law to provide for two thirds. Never. So therefore, has the even state the, even the, us? the advisory opinion in 20, 2011 by the Supreme Court, for me. Is, was misplaced because all that the late Mutula Kilonzo tried to do was to try and implement from the executive the principle. Unfortunately, it, was, it never saw the light of day. It was actually with the drone before even the 10th parliament uh, existed. So if it's the state's mandate, has the state failed us? The state is you and me. Yeah? So we have all failed. That's what I'm saying. So we have all failed. Because, remember, in Article 1, the sovereign, who is who has sovereign authority? Is you and me. We are the people we elect. Yeah? So what is it that I'm going to do? Even if you dissolve parliament today, how are you going to ensure that the, the one there, two thousand data rule is observed? It is not, it's not, it's not parliament which is, which is going to elect itself. It is the sovereign. The sovereign will of the people is manifested in the decisions they make at an electoral, in an electoral cycle. And therefore, when I hear people talk about, oh, parliament has failed to enact to that gender rule, I say, where, where is that, where is that obligation? Law Society of Kenya. I've seen the, the current uh, president right, they, of the Law they've, Society. Right, they've asked for the dissolution of oh, yeah. parliament. 
I'm willing to have the parliament dissolved. And then, 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 then let us see what, when you dissolve parliament, there must be an election within 60 days. How are you going to ensure that uh, the resulting parliament will be, will be, will be two thirds, not more than two thirds of either gender? It's no way. I mean, this is all tired thinking. I think, uh, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm always straight shooting. It is tired thinking to expect without what we have done in the representation of persons, uh, marginalized persons law, to compel political parties. But that's, that's just to compel them as to whether the electorate, the sovereign, will elect one third women. In fact, after that, we'll move to 5% persons living with disability, youth. How are we going to ensure that? You know, these things, they are principles which we found ourselves in our constitution, and they are very good. I think they speak to a greater good of society. But how we go about implementing them is a matter that we should think very carefully about. It's not something that you can go to dictate to the, to the voter. Do you think it's achievable? It is achievable through the ballot. But this, this route people are trying to go, or forcing parliament to do this or the other, what? No, no, no. It is not appointive. In fact, if you look at Article 27, Clause 6 talks about appointive and elective offices. It is easy to achieve this in appointive positions. Elective, you would have to go and withdraw the power of the electorate in Article 1, sovereignty of the people. All right, let's talk about the different arms of uh, government. And many say that legislators are not truly independent. The executive is not adhering to the separation of powers and exerting influence on the House. What's your view on this? I think Kenyans uh, largely don't even read, I think. Did you not see recently the attempted impeachment of Donald Trump? In the House, House of Representatives, the Democrats are a majority. They carry the day. Yeah? In the Senate, the Republicans are a majority. When the managers of the, of the impeachment suits took the case to the Senate, I hope Kenyans can read these things and even see. I, I, I was seeing it on NTV. The senators, Republicans, were saying, people are making very serious uh, allegations about, the, about, about, about President Donald Trump. But what were the Republican uh, senators saying? Put the question, put the question. We don't want to hear all this. That should tell you. The legislature and the executive are co-joined at the hips. These people are put into office through a process called election. The president, who is the head of the executive, belongs to a political party. Does he lose the party? Because he has become the head of the executive? Certainly not. Do the legislators leave their leader because they are legislators? No. So this thing about, the thing which I really want Kenyans to understand, please, let them read a bit. I want Kenyans to read a bit to understand the, the concept, the principle of separation of powers. It does not mean subservience, yeah, it doesn't mean that, but it means robustly engaging each other, vibrantly, in an exchange of ideas. We may differ, we may agree. The fact that we agree doesn't mean that uh, you have become subservient to me. No, no, no. At this point, we've got to take a quick break on the big interview. Stay with us more when we return.
Welcome back. You're watching The Big Interview. There have been instances where top government officials, officials I beg your pardon, have ignored House and committee summons, for example, in the face of defiance. What do you make of, of not, that? Not, not, not allowed in the National Assembly, uh, I can assure you. Because Article 95, Clause 5, sub paragraph B, places the oversight of all state organs in the National Assembly. The National Assembly oversights all state organs and all state officers and commences the process by which they can be removed from office. So I want to tell you, and I've always told the uh, chairman of committees, don't complain, don't, don't go complaining out there. Come and report the matter. That's the issue. If I am convinced that, uh, yes, a person, a state officer has failed, refused, and or neglected to attend at some meeting. It's not everything which is a summons. You know, unfortunately, everybody uses the word summons very loosely. It's not everything. They are mainly invitations to attend. If it comes and, you know, you give your reasons, maybe, I didn't know it is normal. You could be unwell. You could be engaged in something else on that particular day and time. But all you need to do as a state officer who has been invited, give either said somebody to represent you. And if the committee feels that the person who has been sent doesn't have sufficient authority to respond to the issues that they may want to know, set another date for you, the particular state officer, cabinet secretary or principal secretary, to attend and explain. It is not war, but of course, uh, because we have too many young, young members, some of them don't even understand the parliamentary processes. They say, we are investigating you. We are doing this, we are doing, we are going to summon you. How? As a former MP and now, of course, the speaker, do you believe that the constitution has expanded the democratic space and also the rule of law? To a very, very large extent. The Constitution has expanded the democratic space in this country. And I think we owe, we owe it to ourselves to defend and protect uh, the space that has been created. Uh, I, I would do uh, myself uh, be uh, you know, hard pressed to, to degrade, degrade any of these uh, achievements that have been brought uh, by our constitution. Implementation of the constitution, of course, um, is not uh, instant coffee. Yeah? <laughs> it's not, you know, there will be challenges here and there. You know, that's why we have uh, the judiciary. They give us, uh, they go and they tell us, no, what you did here was not right. But you know, remember, they can't make the law. They will interpret. They cannot. The authority to make law is vested. If you read Article 94, in Parliament at the national level, and in the county assemblies at the devolved levels, the the judiciary can go and disagree with the certain laws that we have made and say they can even say this is not in keeping with the constitution or this is not implementing the constitution properly. But they, they, their work remains to interpret. It's up to us now, as legislators, to look at it and say, what, what, is it, what, is it that we, what is it that we missed? How could we make this better? Well, what do you make of now the further push for more reforms through the BBI? Well, remember, um, the Constitution is not a Bible. <laughs> Neither is it... Uh, the Quran, and having been made by man, I'm going to use the one man here, I mean both men and women, having been made by man, it is therefore amenable to alterations, amendments, and changes, including very radical changes to it. And the constitution itself has provided in Articles 255, 250, no, two, actually 256, 257, the mechanism 
for its reform or amendment. So as long as uh, you meet the thresholds uh, put in 250 and 257, no harm. And I, and I think to the extent that uh, I don't think whether the push even in the, in the BBI is one that uh, seeks to whittle down the gains that have been uh, achieved through this constitution. I think it's a welcome thing. Well, is the National Assembly ready for a, par for a parliamentary process if we come to that? The National Assembly has particularly been um, very keen on any proposals. But remember, to amend the constitution is not a matter for the National Assembly. A constitutional amendment must be considered by both houses of parliament. Yeah. We have MPs. There are some MPs who are called uh, senators and some other MPs who are called MPs. I know you know that. <laughs> you know yes. that. Any proposal to amend the constitution through a parliamentary initiative, and that's why it is called, so, you know, if you read 255 and 256, it's called parliamentary initiative must of necessity involve both houses of parliament. How much of the handshake is just politics? Handshake? No. Is that my domain? Do you? In, just you know, your view. You know, let me say this. Eh? I think the handshake, the handshake, as far as I'm concerned, in recent years, has done great to allow people to think and treat each other normally. Even honorary folks. Hmm? You don't have, I don't have to disagree with you merely because you belong to, or you support so and so. I can disagree with you even though we support the same person. But the fact, to the extent that uh, even honorary folks would disagree or even fight, maim, or even kill in the name of whom they support, I think. I'm, I mean, I'll be failing in my duty in not recognizing uh, what the hardship has done for the country and for the folks. When you look ahead now to the next 10 years, what future do you see for this country and when it comes to the rule of law and also democratic ideals? Let me say when it comes to the rule of law, um, personally, I, I hate a situation whereby uh, you, you apply two variants of laws. The law must apply to all in equal measure. But it doesn't. I agree. I agree. And I you know I'll tell you because I have, a, I have a background with the judiciary myself. Yeah? I know on numerous occasions, like we've seen even this week, I mean, I saw things that I couldn't believe in. On 16th of, the, of November 1991, I attended a, a very huge rally in Kamukunji, because I wanted to hear what Kenyan leaders were saying. I was then a judicial officer. The next Monday, one of the people I, I saw speaking, I do after the meeting, dispersed peacefully, was brought before me. I said, what, what has he done? Oh, he attended an, an unloved meeting. I said, oh gosh, do these people know that I was actually there myself? I said, okay, but why bring him to Machakos? If the offense, the scene of crime was Kamukunji, I think the nearest court is Makandara. Why are you bringing him here? You are incurring a lot of costs, even bringing police witnesses to come and testify again. Is this old man? Uh, let me not say what happened to me. But, uh, because tell us, I, tell I, us I, what happened. Because I, I believed that uh, what I was doing was right. So I said, no, this is a simple matter. And the guy should go, he's on free board, he can go. That was not very, very not, not very well received. 
And I said, what, what, what mistake have he, has he done? And I said, even when I was called about it, I said, no, look, that offense was committed in Nairobi. Why are you bringing the fellow in to Machakos, 65 kilometers? Are you not incurring a lot of unnecessary costs? You are, you are wasting taxpayers' money. Why? And then you bring with so many vehicles, only one person. I'm sure you saw something this week. <laughs> so let me not go right. there. But I, 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 I believe very firmly in a situation whereby the law should apply to all equally. Let me treat you with the courtesy that I expect you to treat me with. Ten years on, is the Constitution respected in your view? Ten years, to a very large extent, yes. With a lot of challenges though, because, um, let me say, the, the, um, you know, what you call the paradox, the paradigm, you know, kind of shifted to really to a great extent. Uh, we didn't have uh, we didn't have uh, counties, county governments. Remember the, the first few, the first year I think so. You would find uh, people with all manner of vehicles uh, hovering, you know, the excellencies are passing and what. You know, that excitement also. But we must allow for it to happen. With time, it's a school. Remember, even uh, what you call the summit was not a regular thing. Because, you know, it brought in a different uh, situation. You are up here, the national government, and you're calling people, calling themselves uh, excellencies from the village, uh, governors. Ah, this brought a lot of... But you know what? Give credit where it is due. I think we have tried. And I can see things normalizing. Now, separately, um, when we see parliament proceedings on television, for example, it can be extremely interesting and exciting and humorous to watch um, a lot of the time, frustrating as well. Um, what is it that you love about your job as speaker? I wish you are a member of parliament because I will then want, I will not leave the chair until I hear what your contribution. Until I speak. <laughs> because you know what? It's, it's, it's so good to hear different, uh, different ideas from people from different backgrounds. You know? It's like good thing. And I think it's very satisfying. When I come, when I come home to sleep, oh, I always go back and then I see, I remember, I remember I go through, oh, so I saw saying <laughs> this and, you know, it satisfies me. <laughs> well, what would you change and do differently? What would you want to see different in the house? If I want to really succeed and persuade the people who are dealing with this BBI thing, I want them to even indicate Parliament. Now, fix. Parliament sits on Tuesday morning from 9.30, because they always argue that there is traffic jam and things like that, you know, there are no manner of excuses. Our Senate does not sit in the mornings at all. Parliament, National Assembly should sit from 9.30 on Tuesday to 1 o'clock, 2.30 to midnight. You know, you are representing people. When you get 20 minutes, 15, 20, 30 minutes to explain something, you know, you are able to persuade many more people as opposed to these 10 minutes. What is your comment on the current stalemate regarding the revenue sharing formula? It is to be expected that Parliament, and in this case, particularly the Senate, would then take the report from the Commission on Revenue Allocation, make whatever modifications it uh, deems necessary and appropriate and suitable to the country. That report from the Commission on Revenue Allocation has been lying in the Senate for more than one year. 
it's really unfortunate that this and to wait until we are through with the, the Division of Revenue Act, which has already been signed. And unfortunately, given the, 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 the Division of Revenue defines revenue vertically, so the national government and all national institutions, the judiciary, parliament, all the constitutional commissions, they are functioning. It is inconceivable that the constitution intended to have a situation where one level of government will not function on account of uh, uh, not being uh, funded. That's why I say it's an unfortunate situation that uh, we, we find ourselves in. Uh, it shouldn't be. It should, this situation should never have uh, you know, developed to what it has become. All right, thank you so much. You've been watching the big interview with my guest, Speaker of the National Assembly, Justin Muturi. Thanks very much for watching. I'm Smriti Vidyarthi.